Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Leipzig here from Vancouver. We'll just give it a moment and let people filter in. It's a real privilege to be moderating this uh, excellent session. Well, it's one past the hour. We have a jam-packed hour, and I really want to make sure that we have enough time, not only for these excellent presentations, we have three presenters today, but also for a really robust uh, conversation and dialogue. Uh, this is a very exciting time, obviously, as we know, recent update in the American College of Cardiology and AHA chest pain guidelines, which really create an opportunity for broader adoption and utilization of cardiac CT based very much on the evidence that, that we have collectively developed as a field over the last 15 years. Um, I wanna thank SCCT for creating this forum and I wanna thank Heartflow for sponsoring. Uh, we have three exceptional speakers that are really gonna talk about three key components of how we move forward uh, post guidelines with the integration of this, uh, uh, these new opportunities to best serve our patients. We'll start with Dr. Uh, Marish Ferencik, who's an Associate Professor of Cardiology at OHSU in Oregon. Uh, Marish is obviously known to all of us, serving on the executive of the SCCT and having published some of the most uh, seminal works in the field of cardiac CT, particularly as it relates to atherosclerosis and risk. Uh, that will be then followed by uh, Dr. Jeff uh, Rose. He's the president of Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute. I'm really excited uh, that Jeff was willing to share his thoughts with us today because he and his group have very much leaned in to a CT first strategy, even in advance of the guidelines. And so he'll share some of those opportunities and learnings. And then finally, uh, Charlie Taylor, who's one of the co-founders and Chief Scientific Officer of HeartFlow, uh, a, a former uh, a professor at uh, Stanford University in bioengineering and an adjunct professor uh, in uh, bioengineering, sorry, bioengineering, at, uh, adjunct professor at the Technical University of Eindhoven and University of Texas in Austin. He'll be sharing some of the opportunities and challenges uh, of integrating new tools and developing new tools to extract even more from coronary CT. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Marish to kick it off. The title of his talk is uh, The Role of CCTA and FFRCT in the 2021 ACCHA uh, Chest Pain Guidelines. Marish, thank you again for... Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you for the SCCT uh, organizing this, uh, this webinar. So I will kick it off with the role of coronary CTA and FFRCT in the new 2021 Chest Pain Guidelines. Uh, these are my disclosures. So the new chest gate guidelines are really interesting. These are the, probably the first guidelines that are focused on a symptom. These are first AHA, ACC, and multi-society guidelines that specifically focus on the symptom of chest pain or the other presentations that are similar to chest pain. Uh, this is a figure one, which really summarizes the main messages. And in, uh, in my presentation, I will focus on a few of the main messages. The first one is that Routine testing is not necessary, very important. The second message that we use either clinical decision pathways or structures risk assessment to really determine who benefits from the testing most. And we'll really focus on that group of patients. I think from the field of uh, cardiac CT, the really the most important uh, message is the change in the definition of known coronary artery disease. Coronary artery disease is not just obstructive CAD. Previously, we really used the term CAD as something that's def defined as a significant obstructive disease on anatomic testing, typically more than 50% stenosis, positive stress test, or prior MI or revascularization. In this guideline, the term CAD includes non-obstructive atherosclerotic plaque and, of course, obstructive CAD. And I believe the intent of the guideline writers was to ensure that those with lesser degrees of stenosis who do not require coronary intervention but would benefit from optimized preventive therapy do not get overlooked. Finally, the very important part is this pyramid. You know, how do we decide on the chest pain patient which test to use and whether to test? And in the first part of my talk, in the next slides, I will focus on the left-hand side, on the acute chest pain. As you can see, as you go from low risk to high risk in ACS, you use different strategies for the workup of the patients. Clinical decision uh, pathways are used to risk stratify patients, and this is a class one indication. I don't have time to really det in detail to go through it, but you can find this in the guideline. If you determine that the patient is low risk for ACS based on CDP, there is no testing required and patient can be discharged without further testing. This is a significant change from the prior guidelines where the testing within 72 hours was strongly recommended. 
Once you have low risk, you can discharge the patient and manage the patient as outpatient without further testing. On the other side of the spectrum, you have patients at high risk. Uh, these should go to invasive coronary angiography. This is a class one indication, again, for uh, further management. Really for us in CT field, the most interesting part of the populations, of course, is the patients with intermediate risk. And in those further di di diagnostic testing may be indicated. Depending what is the history of the patient, the guideline recommends following. If you have known coronary artery disease and no prior testing, so no recent prior testing, there are now two class one indications for performance of coronary CTA and stress testing. More specifically, Coronary CT has a class one level of evidence A indication as a useful tool for exclusion of atherosclerotic plaque and obstructive CAD. There is class one BNR, meaning non-randomized level of evidence for exercise ECG and stress testing with imaging as a useful tool for the diagnosis of myocardial ischemia. Once you decide to perform coronary CTA and get results, here, is the man here are the management recommendations. If there are no disease, you discharge the patient. If there is non-obstructive disease, you still discharge the patient to outpatient follow-up. But there is a very important message. The patient that has non-obstructive disease is now diagnosed with CAD. They have known coronary disease, and outpatient follow-up for preventive guideline-directed medical therapy is critical. If you find obstructive disease that is high risk or patient has frequent angina, and uh, the high risk is defined through the guideline with the stenosis more than 50% in the left main coronary artery or anatomically significant three-vessel disease with more than 70% stenosis. If there is high-risk disease, invasive coronary angiography has class 1 indication. Now, if you find obstructive disease or the test is inconclusive, you have two options. You can de decide to manage patient medically with guideline-directed therapy. However, if you need further clarifications of the patient risk and patient symptom assessment, uh, how it relates to imaging findings, there are two 2A two class indications. There's a class 2A level of evidence BNR, non-randomized evidence for performing FFRCT in those who have 40 to 90% anatomical stenosis in the proximal or middle coronary artery. FFR can be useful for the diagnosis of vessel-specific ischemia and to guide decision-making regarding the use of coronary vascularization. For stress testing, there is class 2A level of the CEO, meaning expert opinion, evidence for those who have inconclusive coronary CTA. In those patients, stress testing with imaging can be useful for the diagnosis of myocardial ischemia. Once you get the results of the testing, further decision can be based on the results of the test. If the FFRCT is abnormal, less than 0.8, or there is moderate to severe ischemia, invasive coronary angiography is appropriate with class 1 indication. If there are no ischemia or FFRCT is not abnormal, guideline-directed medical therapy for atherosclerosis should be instituted and patient discharged home. If you have prior testing within the few, last few years, the guideline recommends slightly different workup. If there is prior completely normal test, the patient should be discharged. And this is a very important message uh, that if you have a patient that had e invasive coronary angiography or CTA within the two years that has no plaque or stenosis, you should discharge the patient uh, to outpatient setting unless there is abnormal EKG or elevated high sensitivity troponin. Stress testing has a warranty period of one year. The group of patients that has known coronary disease, and this is very important to understand, these are the patients traditionally known to CAD, so obstructive CAD, prior uh, abnormal stress test, but also patients that have known obstructive CAD, including patients that had, for instance, coronary artery calcium scoring and the prior chest, uh, chest CT. These are now in known CAD category. The guideline emphasizes that the first step should be really deferring of testing and intensifying a guideline-directed therapy unless there's no high-risk anatomy or frequent angina, frequent symptoms, in which case you can go to invasive coronary angiography. 
if you have non-obstructive coronary disease on prior testing, and this is a novel thing, if you have prior test and atomic test with non-obstructive disease, you can choose a CTA in its class 2A BNR evidence uh, to sort of look for the progression of atherosclerotic plaque and obstructive CAD. And if you find obstructive CAD, further workup is similar uh, to prior workup, including stress testing or uh, FFRCT with 2A indication. The further stress testing is for those who have new onset or worsening symptoms on the prior testing at either non-obstructive disease or obstructive CAD disease. So with this, I will move now to a stable chest pain population. Again, the same pyramid going from sort of low risk to high risk patients and determining the testing needs based on that risk assessment. The risk assessment is performed by pretest probability. The pretest probability that was summarized in the European Heart Association, European High Society, uh, European Society of Cardiology uh, uh, guideline actually uh, is, is used. Now, the guideline recognized that the PTP estimates in the modern era are significantly lower than the old studies. And you can see it here that um, these are the probabilities based on age, sex, and uh, symptoms presenting chest pain or dyspnea. And where you have these markers below and max five, it means depending on what type of chest pain they have, whether the chest pain is cardiac, probably, possibly cardiac and non-cardiac. The atypical chest pain is not used in these guidelines anymore. And these are the, actually the higher ranges of the estimate. The guideline also recognizes that addition of calcium score can provide improvement of the assessment. And finally, because of this low, relatively low new estimate of obstructive disease, both intermediate high-risk groups are in the one category that is recommended to obtain testing and not going directly to invasive coronary angiography. The guideline recommends uh, testing deferral in those who have pretest probability less than 15%. And you can see that's a pretty significant group of patients. Specifically, there's class one BNR recommendation to defer these patients from testing. Emphasizing defer doesn't mean do not test. It means that you initially defer and then based on symptoms and further risk assessment, you may need some in some of those patient testing. There are also two additional interesting indications in this population of patients, 2ABR randomized for performing calcium scoring to detect calcified plaque and sort of identify patients with very low likelihood of obstructive CAD. And class 2ABNR to look for the exercise testing induced symptoms and ischemia. Now for patients that are intermediate or high-risk group, again, for stable patients, boy, intermediate and high-risk group, and have no known coronary artery disease, you have, again, two class one indications, coronary CTA and stress testing with imaging. Again, specifically 1A has a 1A indication for CTA as an effective tool for diagnosis, risk stratification, and guiding treatment decisions. And class 1BR randomized for stress with imaging for effective diagnosis of myocardial ischemia and risk assessment of MACE. How to decide between the tests? The guideline provides some, uh, some factors that fa favor one of the tests. The first level is the favor based on a, a risk assessment of obstructive CAD. Younger patients and those who at PTP have less obstructive CAD suspected are favored to have CTA. On the other side of the spectrum, older patients and more obstructive CAD suspected based on PTA, PTP can go to stress testing. However, there are other factors. These are not absolute recommendations. Very important factor is the question that you as a clinician ask. If the question is to rule out obstructive coronary disease, but also detect non-obstructive plaque, especially in patients that is not on optimal preventive therapies like aspirin statin, CTA with its ability to detect non-calcified plaque can be prepared. When your clinical question is ischemia-guided management, you are wondering whether a patient has ischemia, the stress testing is the right test. And about the finally, and Dr. Rose is going to, I'm sure, talk about it, then I think the most important thing, actually, the decision is your ability to perform tests with high image quality and have a local expertise and pathway to perform very good tests. This is a critical part that's important in the, in the guidelines. Image quality and expertise should be a very important deciding factor which test to choose at your institution. Now, if you obtain the test 
and you have non-obstructive coronary artery disease or obstructive CAD, there are two 2A class indications for further testing. There's 2A DNR indications for patients to perform FFRCT if they have 40 to 90% stenosis in proximal or middle coronary segment on CTA. And there's 2A class BNR indication for patients to perform stress testing with imaging if the CTA was inconclusive and the ischemia needs to be further evaluated. Further management is very similar to acute chest pain. If there is moderate ischemia or abnormal FFRCT, invasive coronary angiography is appropriate with class one indication. Now the guidelines throughout the text emphasizes the need for intensification of guideline directed therapy as ischemia or other trials taught us, really the guideline directed medical therapies are critical. And the further testing can be optional for those who have persistent worsening or increased frequency of symptoms. The role of CTA in the patients with known CAD is relatively limited, but there is a very interesting new indication. And this is the, for the patients that have non-obstructive coronary artery disease on prior imaging. In those patients, the first step should be intensification prevent of preventive strategies, acknowledging that the overall guidelines that still live in that traditional assessment of coronary disease don't really provide clear guidance what these preventive strategies are, but I think as a field, we're going to move there very quickly and define these in the near future. Now, in the patients that have persistent symptoms, coronary CTA with FFRCT as needed based on the results of the CTA have class 2A indication. Similar indication is there for stress testing. The further workup then is the better order for the management depends on the results test and basically is identical with the other, uh, other recommendation. So these are sort of key elements or key recommendations from the guidelines. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I look forward to further discussion uh, at the end of these talks. Thank you for that elegant and uh, thorough review of the guidelines. A lot to talk about. I've entered a couple more questions on my list, but please enter your questions in the chat. We'll be sure to get to them at the end. Without further ado, to keep us on track, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Rose to the podium, uh, virtual podium on adoption and growth strategies in CT imaging. No one better to give this talk than you, Jeff. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Jonathan, thank you very much. Um, pleasure to be here. So uh, I have no discussion no disclosures for this talk. Um, so what I'd really like to talk about before we get into the how in terms of uh, growth and adoption, I'd like to talk a little bit about the why. And I think that um, if we're uh, frank, the goals of chest pain evaluation for the last 50 years or so in general have focused on a physiologic assessment. And that is for my patient with chest pain, is coronary artery disease the reason for my patient's symptoms? And basically what we would learn from the test is would my patient benefit from revascularization? In other words, from an ischemia evaluation, depending upon the severity of ischemia, would we be in a position to improve our patient's outcome through revascularization therapies? And with that approach, uh, this is a summary. This is a little bit dated from uh, 2014, but uh, the literature is rife with examples of this approach in when we are making our best clinical judgments and actually taking patients to the labs with the tests that we have had, by and large, we have found over 50% of the time that the patient we took to the lab and put through an invasive test didn't have obstructive disease. And basically we've, we've found a voltage drop, if you will, as the implementation scientists would tell us when we look at our sensitivities and specificities of our various modalities, but then we get to the real world and actually apply them and look at outcome, we see that um, there's more opportunity uh, than we've been able to gain thus far with physiologic testing. Um, early experience, and again, this is from 2014 with an anatomic uh, approach suggested a better outcome. And, and if we look at that with some more contemporary data, this is the Pacific trial published in 2019. This is a cohort of over 200 patients, all of whom underwent the test you can see in the upper right-hand corner, and also underwent invasive coronary angiography with invasive FFR. And you can see the performance of an anatomic approach 
supplemented with physiologic data in terms of our ability to um, uh, capture important uh, vascular disease. This was also shown in the platform study. Uh, Pam Douglas published this. This is the one-year outcome back in 2016. And you know, sort of a, a, a pragmatic trial, if you will, using best clinical judgment, patients who felt were at a high enough clinical risk that they should proceed to the cath lab. The experience in this trial, similar to what we saw earlier, was about a third of these patients actually had obstructive disease warranting revascularization. If instead in that same cohort, sequentially, you took the same population and instead had those patients undergo anatomic testing with FFRCT prior, you could find that um, you could uh, reduce the number of patients who would subsequently need to undergo catheterization. And to basically summarize it from a healthcare perspective, do we want to cath 10 people to find the three who actually will benefit from revascularization, or do we want to cath four to find those same three? And that's largely the question that drives the why. But in addition to that, aside from a stress test being a yes, no, positive, negative, and by how much, we've also learned that plaque morphology is important in terms of outcome. This is just one such um, experience that was published all the way back in 2009, uh, demonstrating that the morphologic characteristics of the plaque are predictive of subsequent outcome. And in patients who have, quote, negative stress tests, there still may be opportunities to make a difference in terms of intervention. And to that point, the five-year outcome from the Scott Hart trial showed exactly that. When we used an anatomic approach, there was more opportunity for preventive therapies, which translated into better patient outcome in the long run. So I would submit that our approach today isn't just about, will my patient benefit from revascularization in terms of reducing MACE, but can we learn more about our patients as well? What is the morphology and the extent of plaque? Are there opportunities to advance care you know, in that regard? So um, we've just heard a, you know, a beautiful uh, talk summarizing uh, the guidelines, the, the wealth of data that has been collected over the last uh, uh, two decades, if you will, has really been distilled nicely in the presentation we just heard in terms of now the, the 1A recommendations. So let me pivot a bit to talk a little bit about our experience as these data were emerging as how we began to think about a CT first strategy uh, in our Heart and Vascular Institute. What you see here is a um, grid that we went through in terms of the analysis of the various modalities that we have in clinical practice. And we, um, in our particular institute, stress echocardiography, SPECT imaging, and then CT um, really became the options as we were weighing um, the availability of the technologies and how we would use them. And then you can just take each of these technologies and yes, no, stress echo positive or negative. What will that volume look like after a year? And with this uh, mechanism, you can actually plug in from experience in practice what uh, rates of return will be in terms of revenue and so forth. And I've highlighted in green what the experience would be at the bottom in terms of a CT approach here. Obviously, if the CT is negative, there's revenue implications. We don't have a methodology here to really get into the benefits of um, preventive approaches and things that we would learn from that morphology. But if we just do the straight up analysis, you can walk through here. And this is how we began to approach how we would begin to implement this in clinical practice. What we um, uh, projected uh, out of this, and I will show some data in uh, just a few minutes about what this means if we're increasing the number of patients going to the cath lab who actually need to be revascularized. So if we were going to build a program like this, how would we do it? And data in the upper part of this slide come from at Axiom. So it's about a 60 to one ratio uh, in the United States today of SPECT imaging to CT imaging, just in terms of how we are approaching uh, the chest pain question in, in our patients. Um, and so obviously if we're moving towards this kind of pathway, we have, to, we have to build the mechanisms, we have to build the capabilities. And some of the factors, success factors in the program you see listed here before you, obviously 
the CT scanners with um, capabilities uh, to perform high quality imaging. We have also found as we've been standing up our program that having um, a particular attention to scheduling the studies. Um, as, as most of uh, the work happens in conventional radiology departments and with their assets and teams, um, cardiac imaging involves a little bit more of um, a detailed approach in terms of patient preparation. So we wanna make sure we're always getting the right patient to the right place at the right time. So having advanced schedulers has been helpful as has been a nurse navigator to help with operations. Um, as the program has grown, we've been able to um, uh, train and have specific expertise in our, in our cardiac nurses and CT technicians, and then also a 3D lab support to facilitate image processing. But, you know, one of the key areas here in the change management paradigm is really the patient selection for this particular modality. Now, this will vary um, based on institutional experience, based on particulars of, of CT equipment and the like, but in general, the appropriate patient is obviously going to be the patient who has an intermediate probability for coronary artery disease and has an absence of those factors that are likely to make the images of less quality. And you see some of those features at the bottom, severe obesity, heart rates, and so forth. Now, we have found workarounds for many of these things, but particularly as programs are starting, these are, these are real issues. And I would say, as in any change management paradigm, early wins are important. So as we're moving into using this type of technology and gaining the confidence of our patients and our clinicians, we really want to be uh, key for success. And these are some of the success factors that we found very early on. Um, to have a program um, uh, that is growing, we clearly need to have physician readers. And aside from the education that physicians uh, can get through a variety of, of different methodologies, either through fellowship or post-fellowship training. We've also found it very important to have a lead physician who, quote, owns the program, who is able to uh, enhance the training of our physician readers with real-world experience and uh, pitfalls and other things that one might experience in, quote, the real world uh, to advance um, the, the quality of the program and having a very rigorous quality assessment program, again, uh, for building a program becomes very important. Um, for those in the U.S., I, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but, you know, invariably conversations will arise about reimbursement and those types of things. I'll talk about reimbursement in a second from a system perspective. But as many physicians are in RBU-based arrangements with health systems and practices and so forth, I've just outlined what the numbers are here in terms of standards for work RBUs. And you can see that CT is compatible with stress. It may come down to how workflow and work is arranged in individual practices as to how this works out in terms of undergirding uh, physician compensation in, in practices. Um, to share um, quickly with you our experience, we uh, began uh, our work um, in earnest in 2013. Um, obviously, the data that we had to build from in that era, this was prior to um, the emergence clinically of FFRCT and so forth. But you can see in this grid, the growth that we have had, and this growth has been organic, but also I would say because of the trust that our clinicians have had in the technology and the reliability and reproducibility, it has you know, become somewhat self-propelled with really you know, fairly astounding growth rates over the last several years, COVID notwithstanding. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the impact more globally into a, a healthcare system by this approach. What we projected from the earlier curves, our earlier uh, algorithm that I mentioned to you was that those patients who underwent CT, a higher proportion of those patients would indeed, who underwent invasive angiography, be in need of revascularization. And this is what we have found over the last several years. So we have um, nearly doubled the rates of those undergoing uh, elective invasive angiography who subsequently need to undergo either um, uh, percutaneous or surgical revascularization. And this has had significant impact on uh, net revenue in our cath lab. So I think when we are thinking about this, it's very easy to partition 
uh, care into the imaging lab and the cath lab and other places. But when we look at it all in and organically in terms of the impact, we have found this to be very positive for our program and more importantly for our patients in terms of their particular experience. So as I'm finishing up here, just some to go back and really focus on some of those success factors for any CT program to grow. Obviously, high quality imaging assets, it's not just the, the equipment, but it's the protocols and the techniques that we're utilizing. We have to have the support staff who are appropriately trained. I would really encourage uh, those who are embarking down this path to strongly consider CT navigators and schedulers similar to our structural heart programs and the success we have had as we've stood those programs up. We've also found that having robust workstations at home for physicians has really amplified our program. And we've also had great collaboration within our cardiology division and our radiology division to make this work. Um, but at the end of the day, this is a change management problem. So people have to be willing to embrace change. We have to be um, uh, executing on those early wins. We have to be educating the primary care community, and we also have to be working with payers. I will say uh, the payers, it's a much different environment today than it was even two or three years ago, because I think the value of this uh, technology is really being um, understood by the marketplace. And then last, I would say that what was then called the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, their elements of quality for anything that we do is should be safe, effective, efficient, and patient-centered. And I would argue that an anatomic approach is all of that. But our programs in terms of how we build them need to be structured so that we can apply this in a timely fashion for our patients and it can be equity applied, equitably applied to our patient cohort. So I will uh, stop there and um, turn things over to uh, Charlie Taylor. That was really a wonderful discussion. And I think, uh, you know, highlighting uh, keeping the patient in the in the center, uh, answering the important questions and really uh, making sure that you uh, use imaging to support uh, improvements in the quality of care and certainly have shown us that path and at Atrium. So it's uh, without further ado, we'll welcome uh, Dr. Taylor to the, uh, to the uh, microphone and he's gonna share with us his thoughts around uh, technological technology solutions to today's clinical challenges. Charlie, please. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Jonathan, and um, uh, thank you uh, to Jeff and uh, Marish as well. Um, so I want to uh, talk a little bit about, uh, obviously, some of the things that we've done at HeartFlow, but uh, also what we're doing and, and uh, how we're moving beyond uh, FF, how we're, you know, leveraging FFRCT and, but, and moving uh, into new areas. Um, so uh, just the obvious uh, disclosure, I'm a found ho uh, founder, shareholder, and employee of uh, HeartFlow. Um, so obviously how we started was really focusing on the problem of trying to, how do we combine anatomy and physiology together, uh, leveraging, you know, all the information, uh, the literature from invasive uh, FFR, for example, and, and as you know, our first product, FFRCT. And it is, of course, and this, I think, came up one of the questions in the chat. Just to remind uh, everybody, FFR is, is, you could have a patient with a normal, quote, normal FFR. They could have microvascular disease, low flow. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't mean that uh, their coronaries are normal. Really, FFR is what it is suited for, is to identify disease in the epicardial vessels that is potentially amenable to revascularization. Um, and with a significant enough flow or pressure gradient across the coronary arteries under stress conditions, you can see a lower FFR value. And again, there's, uh, what we know is that there's uh, level, way, level 1A uh, evidence um, and um, this is really supported by, you know, a very robust data. This uh, recent paper out in JAMA demonstrating that a low, that a normal FFR uh, value or greater than 0 0.8, uh, then patients did better with uh, medical therapy. And, um, and conversely, if a patient had low FFR values, they did better with PCI, uh, 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 lower MACE uh, versus, uh, medical, versus uh, medical therapy. Again, the state is still true. It's still true in the post ischemia era. So the question now, and if this is very relevant for the guidelines, is so what happens after coronary CT? If CT is the frontline test, level 1A evidence, what do we do afterwards? And I would submit to you, and I'll just take a second to go through this, and I think this is relevant to the discussion. What do you do as the second test? If CT is done, what, is, what are the characteristics you need for your next test to be able to evaluate function? And this it may be um, a little bit surprising, but what you can't do is to take a test 
you'll not, if you have a high sensitivity test like CT, what you can't do is follow it with a test that has low sensitivity or low negative predictive value, even if it has very high positive predictive value. So this is a really quick thought experiment. 100 patients, let's assume 40 of them have uh, obstructive coronary disease greater than 50% stenosis, and but only 20 of those uh, have a positive FFR. If you assume CT is perfect with 100% negative predictive value, then you'll do CT and you'll find 60 patients, rule those out uh, uh, as not having obstructive disease. If you think of your non-invasive functional test, if it called the majority of patients negative, 75% of patients negative, and if it had a negative predictive value of about 67%, but a perfect positive predictive value, what you would do is you would find 100 or 10 of those patients with obstructive CAD, positive FR, they go to cath, but at a price of taking the other half of the patients in deferring cath and uh, class, reclassifying those patients that were classified as positive by CT as negative uh, afterwards. This is exactly what has been demonstrated in, in trials looking at C, at SPECT following CT and also MR perfusion imaging following CT. These are two papers, again, a 50% uh, rate uh, that patients with positive FFR were missed if SPECT follows CT in the Pacific trial, um, and a 50% rate um, it, when MR perfusion imaging followed CT in the, in the, uh, the reassess trial. So this is not surprising. Again, it's it, because if a test has an insensitivity to functional significance with FFR, then this is a consequence. So this is exactly what we're trying to tackle with FFRCT as a test that has high sensitivity um, uh, uh, for FFR uh, following uh, CT angiography. So there's a very robust uh, data uh, uh, set of now over 400 papers uh, supporting uh, the clinical evidence, and this is the probably the most recent one uh, meta-analysis published in Heart. It's now just available online. A large uh, population of patients, over 5,600, to follow up one to five years, and just demonstrating that a low FFRCT value identified increased risk, and the lower the value was, the more risk. It also showed that FFRCT of negative had an excellent prognosis value. Um, so this is a foundation. So this is where we are, where we started. You know, we're, we're thrilled that we're, you know, now able to offer it to more and more patients and, and continue to do that. And I would say that for the, those of us at HeartFlow, this is what we're most proud about is uh, to be able to, you know, bring this technology to support uh, you, you uh, physicians in the care of your patients. So where do we go from here? Um, where are the, some of the things that we're thinking about? We're, we've touched on a few of these questions. You know, is the FFR, is the, is the epicardial disease limiting the blood supply to the myocardium? But there are a whole range of other questions. Is the disease focal or diffuse, obstructive, non-obstructive? Um, is, is it reducing, you know, is it causal of symptoms? Uh, are there lesions that maybe are elevated risk of rupture? Do they affect a smaller, large portion of the myocardium? And then importantly, how does this information help you better manage your patients uh, going forward? And perhaps how could you follow these uh, patients uh, over time? So where we're, where we're at is with FFRCT, we have our planner product I'll talk about briefly. This is cleared. Uh, we have new data that is out on this. Uh, it's been presented, will soon be published. Um, and then we have two new products, a pre-read and a plaque analysis, leveraging our AI algorithms for doing anatomy, for extracting anatomy, which is in the FFRCT product, and then also extending our um, deep learning algorithms from the inner wall, the lumen, into the outer wall and quantification of plaque. And then finally, I'll, I'll give a brief description of some of our efforts to link epicardial disease all the way to myocardial blood flow. Um, what we hope is that we'll be able to provide is that after CT is performed, to provide a tool to help physicians more easily read the CT, not, not displace the reader, but to be able to provide information before uh, they're reading the data uh, to be able to support and augment uh, their, their ability. And for instance, for a growing practice to be able to do this efficiently. Uh, provide information about atherosclerotic plaque uh, as well, perhaps for those low risk patients. But if the patients are intermediate to high risk to combine the ultimately the anatomy, the physiology, and the plaque together to be able to you know, best support uh, evaluation of your patients and, and then uh, planner uh, as needed if FFRCT is positive. So briefly about planner. Um, first of all, we have a number of sites that are bringing FFRCT into the cath lab. 
I, I think for the interventionalists, they're very often very excited about this because they can get kind of the roadmap for the patient before they walk into the cath lab. And Jonathan always describes it as you'd rather know this information before you go into the cath lab than figuring it out all, all in an ad hoc manner uh, in, the, in the cardiac catheterization lab. Um, planner is a step past that. It's to provide a tool where a physician can identify a lesion, remove it, and predict post-PCI uh, post physiology. Um, the P3 trial just evaluated the accuracy of this. This is presented at, at your PCR. This is out, this is Carlos Collette is a, and uh, Joran Sanka, the primary uh, investigators, and in, in, in Bernard De Bruyne, um, you know, one of the co-fathers of FFR as the chairman of the study. So what was interesting was evaluating patients' different phenotypes. They, both of these, these this patients in the left and right all have positive FFRCT, but one has a diffuse phenotype, a gradual drop in pressure, sees almost no benefit from PCI, whereas obviously patients with a focal stenosis could see a much greater benefit. Most patients are somewhere in between, a combination of diffuse and focal disease. Planner demonstrated met its primary endpoint with a high uh, diagnostic performance for predicting post-PCI FFR. The uh, Fast Track Cabbage trial is underway. It's about a third or cl uh, close to half enrolled. Uh, Patrick Soroyes is the PI for this. And this is using information about CT anatomy, uh, information about FFRCT, and providing this to cardiac surgeons who are operating based upon non-invasive data in this trial. And the, the uh, primary focus is to look at the safety of doing this. Is this, uh, do the physicians, the cardiac surgeons feel that they can do this safely uh, based upon non-invasive data? They have the opportunity to, to bail out in any case and, and ask the uh, patient to go to the cath lab. But um, this will be quite an exciting study following in the Syntex-3 trial. We look at pre-read. Uh, what we're doing here is all of the anatomy that we extract with FFRCT, the 3D anatomy, uh, and with uh, human in the loop AI, uh, we, um, we take the 3D anatomy, we unfold it to create this patient specific view, um, a spider view where we identify the areas uh, where there's lesions, uh, stenosis, for instance, between 50 and 70%, 30 to 50, et cetera. Um, and then we're providing this model together with this uh, CPR uh, images um, with the different lesions, the areas of uh, le uh, disease identified. So the goal is to be able to do this in a manner that will help support the reading of coronary CT, whether it's a simple case of ruling out disease and, and, or, or a more complex case uh, with, for instance, calcium uh, um, non-obstructive disease. Finally, plaque. Um, our goal here is to uh, be able to provide a quantitative plaque analysis. What we did is we licensed the Cedar sinai Autoplaque software. We used that. We trained data uh, using that. Um, together with uh, thousands of cases with our, our uh, FFRCT algorithm and uh, created a classifier, a deep learning classifier to find the outer wall of the vessel. It's full, once FFRCT is done, it's fully automated and uh, the uh, plaque analysis is completed in a matter of a couple of minutes uh, after FFRCT is performed. Um, we can identify the disease vessels, the uh, healthy vessels, again, looking at the outer boundary. And then our goal is to be able to provide kind of a full set of information of, of plaque together with the FFRCT information. To be able to look at the contours, uh, the inner and outer boundary of the vessel, cross-sectional images showing plaque of different, uh, different character, calcified, non-calcified, or low attenuation plaque. And then to be able to quantify and measure the plaque. What this will be uh, very useful for as we go forward is to be able to provide information. This is uh, a CT image in 2010, the same patient data acquired in 2017, where the pathology is automatically tracked between the two time points. Changes in the, in the uh, lesions can be identified, and this patient had increased plaque volume, uh, a, uh, actually no change in non-calcified plaque, but an increase in the amount of calcium, which you can see from the image and, and this, this we believe will be very exciting for being able to track and monitor medical therapy. And then finally is the, for plaque is the assessment of risk. Um, the Emerald uh, trial uh, looked at patients that presented with, uh, with an MI uh, and lesions could be identified at the time of cath. Uh, in this uh, study, it was uh, demonstrated that when you combine uh, lesion geometry, plaque characteristics and hemodynamics, you could get the best predictor for identifying lesions, uh, culprit lesions, 
Um, and uh, this is the Emerald One trial. The Emerald Two trial is now almost fully enrolled, which will have more than 500 patients. Uh, this is Ban Kwan Ku is the PI, uh, Ban Kwan Ku in Seoul National University, and we'll be very uh, eager to see some of the results of that larger uh, Emerald Two uh, trial. Finally, in myocardial insights, uh, volume to mass ratio um, and percent myocardium affected are now cleared. Uh, we're working to get these into the product. Um, in volume to mass ratio is the ratio of the epicardial coronary vessel size to the myocardial mass. It, think of this as, a, as an uh, imbalance or identifying imbalance between the supply capacity of the epicardial vessels and the demand of the myocardium. Um, and uh, percent myocardium is identifying for different lesions or different locations the percentage of the myocardium that is affected. Uh, there's a review uh, paper that was um, is just available online now in JCCT, uh, and this is a nice one of the figures from that um, uh, demonstrating that this is in 3,200 patients. Some patients have small caliber epicardial vessels relative to the myocardial mass. These are patients that often ha have a positive FFR, FFRCT with very mild, relatively mild uh, coronary disease, mild non-obstructive disease, whereas a patient with a high volume to mass ratio will require a much tighter stenosis to be able to see a physiologic significance uh, of lesions. Again, there's been a, um, this review paper is out and uh, encourage you to take a look at it. It's uh, hopefully is uh, very uh, relevant or interesting, especially as we talk more about uh, ANOCA patients. Uh, last slide is as we go forward uh, into the future, and this is uh, now two papers published in biomedical engineering literature, and we're pursuing uh, this uh, activity is to start from the epicardial tree from the CT, generate a synthetic uh, network to fill the vessels, uh, to fill the myocardium, uh, simulate myocardial blood flow, and this is a direct comparison between simulated perfusion and a water pad image. This is in collaboration with Paul, with Paul Knoppen's group uh, in Amsterdam. And the goal ultimately is to connect disease in the epicardial compartment all the way down to uh, perfusion uh, deficits or impact uh, in the myocardium. That's the last slide um, and um, happy to go into the discussion. Thank you so much, Charlie. And I wanna thank all three speakers. That was really tremendous. As is always the case, we have a little bit less time than I would have liked. We could go on probably all day, but we have a good 13 minutes and I'm gonna dive right in. We'll go in order. Uh, I've also been monitoring the chat. There's some really excellent questions. Maybe I can start with you, Marish. Uh, you know, you, you highlighted the pathway for stable coronary disease, which really provides class one level of evidence A for an anatomical approach, and then uh, a much more diagnostic and prognostic, but but less actionable approach using tr tr traditional stress testing. As a clinical cardiologist, and given what we saw in the ischemia trial, are you comfortable just putting people on guideline-directed medical therapy without awareness of the status of the left main? And is that, is that a pathway that, that, that you would be using routinely uh, for patients with a moderate to high pretest likelihood of coronary disease? Marsh? That's an excellent question, Jonathan. Uh, I think uh, the, the results of the ischemia trial are not necessarily really reflected uh, completely fully on this guideline. That's We have just to recognize that. And I think that the analysis that are coming slowly from the, the ischemia trial suggests that extent of coronary atherosclerosis, coronary disease, rather than ischemia, is important prognostically recently published uh, by Dr. Reynolds and Dr. Shaw. Uh, will be important. I think uh, that, that we are in part of uh, four years of the making of these guidelines. So we are sort of always when we publish the guideline a little bit late. So to answer really these questions, I think we'll have to wait for the next guideline. Now, your honest answer, uh, the clinical decision making, the symptoms, the pretest probability will determine that. If the pretest probability is really low, um, you know, uh, probably okay. If the symptoms are recurring, if more frequent, that, that you need to know whether the patient has three vessel loss or left main disease. And we saw that in ischemia, the, the, the anatomic testing is very strong for that indication. And that's how I would think about it as a clinician. Maybe one last question before I pivot away from you uh, over to Jeff, because there's a very good question there. You, you showed very elegantly the table, the table uh, of pretest likelihood. And I really, my eyes glommed on to the 13% pretest likelihood of, a, let's say, a 55-year-old woman with chest pain. Now, 
the guidelines would suggest we really, and I know they're not unrealistic that that woman is never going to get tested. Mm -hmm. But you know, given the definitive nature and the and the and the warranty of a negative CT, uh, obviously, as you say, guidelines will evolve. But do you see an opportunity, unlike traditional stress testing, where I think it is challenging, right? You get some equivocal tests, or even if it's negative, you don't really know if they have CAD. But the definitive nature of CT, do you see opportunities in, in those patients? Um, and then the corollary of it is, uh, you know, in the older patient population, do you really see there being a benefit of stress testing in older patients versus uh, CT, given the um, relatively modest pretest likelihood of even older patients? Excellent questions. The, the answer to the first one is, I think the guideline for both for acute, acute chest pain and for stable chest pain, do have that class 2A uh, BR randomized actually data for uh, calcium scoring. Uh, and I think we have pretty rich data uh, for that type of population. I think we're going to learn again about the quantitative assessment of block and type of block, because that's really what Charlie talked about it, really the prognosis. And we learned that from Scott Hart, low CT attenuation block uh, percent atheroma volume from Scott Hart and promise high risk block features, predictive and non obstructive coronary disease. I mean, detection of these patients will be critical. Now for the defense of the uh, guideline writers, we are lacking ultimately evidence that, it, that the intervention based on these findings change the outcomes. And that's the challenge for the CT community. We need to get the data that show if you have data on non-obstructive disease and black characterization and you treat based on that or follow-up scan based on that, we can change the outcomes. And I think I'm, I'm convinced, you know, I'm confident that it will be in the next guideline. Um, and so that answers your second question. You know, I think really, the, the, you know, assume that you can really get high clinical quality. You know, you follow Dr. Rose's, uh, as, you know, systematic approach in the healthcare system. You have excellent quality of images. You get them. You do your PTP. But then they're really the middle part. The question, what's your clinical question? If the patient is not on preventative therapies, you don't know whether they are atherosclerosis. I personally see a really strong value for coronary CTA, irrespective of age or even PTP, even for the lower risk patients. That's well or high. Yeah. Jeff, you know, maybe pivoting to you, there was an important question about, you know, how did you scale your practice uh, around, uh, around building the, the platforms and the needed technology? the, uh, the uh, trained readers and, you know, how, how does one make this pivot um, uh, to really expand access to coronary CT? That's a great question, you know, and, and I alluded to it a little bit in, in the talk. This is a change management issue, right? I mean, it, we happen to be talking about CT and ischemic heart disease and whatnot, but this is, if, if we approach this through the lens of how do you make system change, right? There's, there's a playbook for that. And, and you have to have champions, you have to have a guiding coalition, you have to you know, have early wins and successes, you have to communicate those successes in repeat, repeat, repeat. And you know, it, we've all done this. I, you know, 10 years ago, most of us didn't have structural heart programs. Most of us do today. Um, right. It really made us have to think differently and work with colleagues in different ways and create positions that didn't exist before but we did it because we saw the value. We right. saw the value in the outcome. And, and I would submit that this is no difference. I think uh, different. I think that the, um, the literature base that we have is very, very strong, but the hurdles that we have to switch, I mean, we're, we're, we're talking metaphorically from moving from the internal combustion engine to the electric car. It just doesn't happen. Even if it's quote right, even if you believe it strongly, to make that change happen is a stepwise approach. So I, I think that really uh, it begins by having institutional champions. It, it begins by beginning to create the infrastructure, both the technology and the human capital within your organization to begin to affect this change. But in the long run, we can't keep capping 10 people to find the three who will benefit from that study. No other business in the world does that. Right. So we, we have better tools. We just need to avail ourselves of 
I think that's really well said. And, and you know, you hit the, uh, you highlighted the, the, the non-actionable coronary disease, but I think one thing that's often missed too is that traditional upfront stress testing, as we know, doesn't give you any information around the atherosclerotic burden and is quite insensitive, in fact, as we know for left main disease and sensitive for triple vessel disease and even, and, and even for physiological uh, significant disease. So there are many patients who are not going to the lab who actually perhaps should be that could be found with a, with a CT first strategy. You know, Charlie, there is a question in the, in the, in the chat, and, and I think it's an important one. Uh, the question um, uh, is, CTFFR is relative, not absolute, as with PET. Uh, so CTFFR does not evaluate CMD. And, you know, before I hand it over to you, I, I, would, I would want you to obviously frame in the context the difference between CFR and FFR, but I would posit, and maybe you can expand on it, that CTFFR is the only tool that actually calculates a pressure value. And we know that the depth of the physiology is really important, that PET may give you a, a surrogate measure of the likelihood of abnormal FFR in a, in a territory, but it doesn't actually quantify the, the fractional flow reserve, nor does it co-localize the pressure to any individual lesion. So maybe, uh, Charlie, you could educate us a little bit about the opportunities of, of, uh, of uh, calculating pressure and how it's different than coronary flow reserve. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I tried to highlight that when you talk about FFR, I, again, as I said, it's, you have to remember it's really focused on epic, the epicardial compartment in disease. And, um, and indeed, you could have a patient that has microvascular dysfunction or microvascular disease, and, um, and you're not, you're, you could have a negative FFR value and you, you won't know, you know, does that patient have microvascular disease. But it's, of course, it's, I think why it's, you know, really taken off is the ability to be able to identify that disease that is really actionable, you know, the actionable disease in the, in the cath lab, for instance, as you think about revascularization approaches. Um, so, um, you know, there's complementary information that's coming from perfusion imaging, but it's, it's really not the information about, about the disease in the epicardial, uh, in the epicardial tree. You're really not going to get that information. I think the other issue is that, you know, if you think about it, as you get all the development of atherosclerosis, you compensatory remodeling, Glagov remodeling, you get a big burden of atherosclerosis that could be present before you then trigger a low FFR, you know, and, and then even if you do, before you trigger a perfusion deficit, wall motion abnormality or EKG change. So it's the kind of the concept of the ischemic cascade that you're, those tests are really uh, appropriate, most appropriate for kind of looking further down the ischemic cascade why you'll you'll have a lower sensitivity, but maybe a better a better specificity. Um, I, I personally think that as we start to look at microvascular disease, I think there's going to be signatures of that in the epicardial vessels. Um, and um, but we'll have to see. You know, we'll have to see about that, and um, we'll see what information we can glean. You know, for the uh, Anoka patients from the data that's available uh, with uh, with CT. Well, I want to, uh, we're now approaching the top of the hour. I wanted to thank the SCCT for creating the forum, obviously Heartflow for sponsoring, and the three speakers for the very elegant discussion. Um, I'm very excited to have borne witness to the evolution of cardiac CT over the last 20 years, really, and, and to see that it, it received class one level of evidence, A, support, because it's the most anatomically accurate, it uniquely identifies plaque, as we know. It is powerfully prognostic, and the prognostic utility extends beyond traditional stress testing. And as we saw from Dr. Rose, it helps guide medical management in a fashion that reduces incident myocardial infarction. With the opportunities of also moving beyond anatomy and integrating physiology, I think we learned a lot about how why the guidelines have now created that opportunity to use CT and non-invasive physiology from CT to help action decisions around revascularization. But I think what I'm most excited about is to really see, based on these guidelines and the learnings from Dr. Dr. Rose, how we can, as a society, continue to educate people, train people, support them in their practice, optimize image quality so that we can do really good work and serve our patients. And when we do that, building on Charlie's discussion and beyond, the data and the information that's actually embedded within the CT, I think we're only scratch, scratching the surface. And it will take obviously many bright minds to continue to extract those other data elements that will help inform additional decisions around, as mentioned, Minoka, microvascular disease and, and planning intervention. So uh, thank you again from Vancouver. Uh, hope everyone has a wonderful day and uh, thank you to the speakers for those excellent presentations.